All right, everybody, thank you for being here this afternoon uh, and uh, sitting through the presentation you're about to receive. I'm David Lasondek. I'm going to be kicking things off here uh, for our big question section on, and we still got people coming in. All right, that's really, really good. Uh, so I'm just going to get going here with the first picture. And there we go. So thank you, everybody, for being here this afternoon to have beginning to have the first big conversation about how we talk about how our hands change the body. This is part of a project we've been working on with the International Consortium on Manual Therapies. And this is the first time we've opened up what we're doing to share with other people in the structural integration community. And a couple of rules of the road first. You're here because we want your feedback. We want you to see what we're doing. And we want to know what your questions are, what your suggestions for improvement are. We want all that. But uh, we also want you to see the material we're going to present before we have that discussion. So we're asking everybody to please use the chat box. You might have an idea, you might have a question right there in the moment, type it into the chat box. Two of our team members are gonna be monitoring the chat box uh, and then helping coordinate the discussion, question and answer section that's gonna happen about a half hour or so, 40 minutes or so into this afternoon's or this morning's program, okay? So that's the basic rule of the road there, okay? So let's talk about the International Consortium on manual therapies. We want to create a productive culture between different manual therapy professions. Thank you all you people who are still continuing to come in. We're just getting started. Quick reminder, comments and questions, please put them in the chat box so that we can keep them in order. I'm going to give it uh, a couple of more seconds here. See if we have any more doorbells coming in. All right, let's keep moving. So we also want to collaborate between clinicians and basic scientists so we can advance the science and the understanding of what we are doing with our hands, how the work we do with our hands can continue to change and enhance people's lives. Now, nothing like this starts without people. So I want you to meet the two people who started this, the first being Brian Dengahart, an osteopath, and uh, the director of the uh, Andrew Taylor Still University Research Department. He still runs clinical hours as well. He is a lifelong handist, so to speak. And he's always been fascinated with the way that touch can have such a profound effect on human beings and their health and their well being. And his buddy on the science side is Paul Stanley. Uh, who I have a science crush on, had a science crush on him for a long time. He's done some truly groundbreaking research uh, into how different types of manual therapy affect the body all the way down to the cellular level. I cite his research a lot in my writings and in the talks that I give. And it's really exciting to be able to work with somebody of Paul's caliber. Now, the two of them met for the first time in 2007 at the first fascia research congress and they really hit it off they sometimes presented at different breakout sessions and they started having a dialogue that went on for years about how to better understand manual therapy and what it does how to research manual therapy and, and paul being a basic scientist one of his one of his uh, chief criticisms was that all these different therapies have their own highly specialized language, and it can be really confusing for somebody who's going to research or collate data on a research project when you could have five thing, five terms mean the same thing. So let's say we were doing something uh, like we've done in, in my department where we have looked at uh, a chiropractic study where we were looking at the difference between adjustments and the activators that they use. Uh, this is where really clear nomenclature makes a big difference. And even if we just go back into the history of anatomy, there was a time when there was over 5,000 words for about 500 body parts. It can get really confusing. 
And that's kind of where manual therapy is now in a lot of ways. So they decided to create this international consortium on manual therapies. And our first conference is gonna be in May of this year. We'll find out more about that later. Uh, and we have invited working groups in the five professions that you see there in gold. You're gonna see a lot of black and gold in this presentation, I'm from Pittsburgh. And we have given everybody in the working groups from these professions um, equal platform to express what they know, equal platform to be challenged in the best ways possible to explain what they mean in order to find common ground, in order for all of us to understand uh, how the underlying mechanism behind what we do work. And today we're extending this collaborative environment to our colleagues here in the structural integration community. So our vision is clear. We want to collaborate. We want to share. We want to include basic science experts from around the world to join us in research and develop new areas of research and leverage what we know to improve health and healthcare across the globe. So where do we start? That's huge. Just take a second, drink that in, what that slide says. This is a big vision. This is about more than just one or two meetings or one conference. We're trying to create an ongoing concern an ongoing forward-thinking organization. So where do we start? Because, you know, it's, it's the old elephant thing. Um, and each one of us has a hand on a different part and we're trying to say what it is and what we're doing. Sometimes we have the hand on the same part, uh, but we don't look at it or think about it the same way. Um, so this is what all of these groups have been tasked with uh, in forming working collaborative partnerships to define our manual therapy procedures. Uh, what are we doing with our hands? That's where it has to start. Uh, then we summarize the physiological theories. Why do we say structural integration works? Why do we say chiropractic works? What are those ideas about? How can we best and most concisely explain them? And measuring physiological effects. What does the science actually say? And that's a topic three. We're not gonna get into topic three today. We're just gonna do topic one and two. And now I want you to meet the team that it has been my extreme pleasure and privilege to be working with now for close to two years, uh, the Structural Integration Working Group. First up, we have Katya Barsh, who uh, recently was uh, a graduated uh, in 2018 from the Anatomy Train School. She's also a, I believe, a 500 hour, maybe it's a thousand, sorry if I got that wrong, Katya. Uh, uh, E-Y-R-T, uh, or I-R-Y-T, uh, which is a registered yoga teacher. She was part of a Delphi study, along with Jan Vilka and Robert Schleip and Vona Klingler from the University of Ulm, and some other folks on developing consensus on contraindications and cautions of foam rolling. She's currently working on her PhD under the mentorship of Robert Schleip. Uh, next, we have Eric Jacobson, who has been a Rolfer since 1974. He's the current president of the Rolf Research Foundation, and you may remember him as actually having funded a study in the uh, early 2010s on structural integration in low back pain and actually getting NIH money to do so. So his, his contributions have been invaluable to the group in terms of both his published science and his longevity in the career of structural integration. Another heavy hitter in the science department is Václav Kremen, who is in the neurology department on faculty at the Mayo Clinic. He's also a member of the Rolf Research Foundation. And uh, if you just go to PubMed and type his name in, you're gonna find about six pages of papers that he contributed to or was the principal investigator for. He did his rolfing training, I believe, in Prague in the inner, in the European group, and now he hangs his hat in the exotic land of Minnesota. And uh, from the UK, but originally from New Zealand, is Bernie Landals. Uh, she is also part of the Rolf Research Foundation. Her book on infant movement for parents is coming out later this year, and she won the Rolf Research Foundation case study uh, report 
in 20, uh, I was gonna say 2010, <laughs> it's COVID time, it's weird, uh, in 2020, or uh, maybe it was 2021, but she got the best case report paper of the year. Um, we're really happy to have her. And then there's this guy. Uh, he's written a couple of books that you might be familiar with. And uh, I also studied a podcast, not just about fascia restructural integration, but about the body in general, because I just figured with 2.3 million podcasts out there, there needed to be 2.3 million in one. There just had to be. And uh, I'm currently practicing at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in their integrative medicine department. Joining us today, however, it is my pleasure to welcome our special guest star. I would be very surprised if somebody in the audience does not know this person or at least heard of her. I'm talking about Liz Stewart, uh, who graduated from the Guild, who taught at the Guild, who taught at SOMA, who mentors and professional groups in structural integration, has deep roots in uh, the world of psychology and groups. And I think knows everybody in the structural integration community. I swear she's introduced me to at least 50%. Uh, and we're just really, really happy to have her here. She is going to be moderating the discussion and the question and answer section. Okay. So now with that said, let's get to the big conversation. Uh, leading this off on topic one is going to be Bernie Landles on how we're explaining what we're doing with our hands. And then Eric's gonna come in and explain, well, what are some of the reasons why we think structural integration works? So with no further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Bernie. Thanks, David, and um, hi to everybody. There's uh, so many of you out there, and I have noticed there's a few non-structural integration uh, people that have snuck their way in. So uh, welcome uh, to you as well. The first thing I'd actually like us to do is look at your hands. In fact, just hold them up so we can all see them. Hold them up because they are a gift. Yeah. And we know that as structural integration practitioners, you know, it is so much more than what we actually do with our hands. Yet it is the one thing that we have in common with other manual therapy practitioners. So the first stop is to define manual therapy procedures, what we do with these wonderful gifts. So in thinking about it, if we could keep in mind the definition of procedures, and I think that will help keep things a little clearer for us. Procedures being a series of actions conducted in a certain order or manner. So I guess what we're trying to do is define the actions of our hands, yeah, what they are doing. And the goal is to find a common language. Um, for understanding and for research. And I think that's really important. So we've made the start, and now we really want to continue the conversation. During the presentation, I'm gonna give you two opportunities to pause for a moment and think, and put some words in the chat. Otherwise, just sit back and relax. I'm gonna show a, a couple of slides first that we actually shared with the rest of the um, conference working committee because a lot of them had actually no idea what structural integration actually was. One or two had received some sessions, but aside from that, I think it was a bit of a mystery for them that we had to unveil. Then we'll cover some of our thinking um, and where we've got to in terms of defining the manual therapy procedures. So we shared the start. Um, Dr. Ida Rolf, we acknowledged, was the founder. And then to share that some of the teaching has been adapted um, from Dr. Rolf's 10 series to the Anatomy Trains 12 series with Tom Myers. And there's other schools that have developed their own protocols and procedures. We explained the approach to working the body around education, of the soft tissue and the person. 
how it is whole body rather than system based and functioning in gravity so life rather than just lying on a table and of course the classic example we could give was back pain yeah you have three people come into your clinic as you well know and their back pain may come from any number of things going on for them so our whole body whole person approach is quite different we sort of outlined some of the goals of structure integration and this by no means is the list um, these were just highlighting some of the key things um, for the group so improved posture within that vertical line of gravity um, having the the body move with more grace and ease efficient a little bit more resilient um, and these will all be familiar terms and uh, I guess ways we convey structural integration re-education and awareness are key things so that was a really important aspect that we're not just solving problems we're looking at a whole person again and the whole body one similarity that a lot of us have in manual therapy though is assessment and so we were able to explain that we do what they do mostly um, though we perhaps have a broader view someone comes in with a shoulder condition we will look at the whole body not just the shoulder so over the last year in our discussions and there have been numerous uh, and there's been some really interesting discussions um, and we've sort of arrived at six, six elements to describe the what the how the where relating to our hands now when I talk about hands I mean it could be an elbow it may be a soft fist it may be fingers it may be thumbs um, we know that you know we apply our techniques with different parts of the body but we came up with the six um, sort of areas of focus one is how we contact our clients we contact them in many directions so parallel or across fiber um, going into the tissues or lifting the tissues so there's a whole different um, a lot of ways that we work with the tissue that we engage our client whether that's on the table they are moving while our hands are on them or we have them in a seated position um, we have them up and moving after a session or during the session to feel um, and you know take on what is happening potential change um, and increase their awareness of what is happening we know that our touch is adapted through the session and that may be pressure it may be the angle it may be the speed it may be the duration um, all based on what we're feeling, what we're sensing in the tissues, and sometimes verbal, nonverbal feedback from the client. And we work layers, um, different layers. And I guess, you know, if we're thinking sleeve, superficial, right through to deep and the core. Um, so we work, I guess, hopefully you're seeing a pattern here that you can't have one of these without the other. Um, and so they are all interrelated and the last one is that we work specific territories um, and some of these are quite different to other manual um, therapies like the intermuscular septor so working in between the adductor muscles perhaps or it might be um, if you're trained with the anatomy trains it may be working those um, superficial back line for instance or just specific lines of tension so we moved on from here and you may well ask here's a big question why is it important to describe what we do with our hands and it comes down to research and science yeah in the science world we need to be able to replicate our actions to prove that something works or doesn't work um, and so why is replication important if you've been involved with any study it's so that somebody else can test the theory um, and see uh, how it how robust it is and how it stands up so keeping this in mind 
we then moved on to, well, how do we describe what we do with our hands? So looking at contact first, here's a list that you all might be familiar with. That our hands glide, they hook, they compress, they hold. You know, we do numerous things with our hands. And of course, at the same time, all of these other key elements are at play. But alone, these terms mean nothing. So for more context, we expanded our view and tried to identify more specific actions of our hands, how and where we work. So in the next few slides, we're going to share our thoughts. Um, things will come to mind, and in a moment, I'm going to invite you to pop them in the chat. And you may have other terms for what we have tried to name. Uh, one term that came up really early on for me is Eric said, well, it's called worrying. <laughs> but what is worrying? So we need to find a way to describe clearly what we are doing. And as a starting point for then unpacking what we think is happening. So if we start with direction, because we don't aimlessly rub. Yeah, we apply our hands in different directions and it's context driven by how the client is presenting, what the tissues are saying to us. I'm not sure if I can say that, but you know what I mean. So here are five ways that we have described what we can do from spreading from a midline along the iliac crest, for instance, to working parallel with the fibres, say the hamstrings, um, across fibres when we have someone seated and we're doing the upper trapezius, to compression or even lifting some fascial sheets or lifting tissues um, upwards or downwards. Um, so I want you to pause for a moment. So with these in mind, with also the thinking that we know we work towards restrictions or away from restrictions, we often pause. Take a moment and think about the directions that you work with your hands and put them in the chat. Of course, the chat's going to keep going, and I've got the wonderful uh, Liz and Katja behind the scenes, so they'll be making a note of these, which we will revisit when we come to the discussion part of the presentation. So don't feel that as I continue, you've lost your moment, you haven't. Uh, keep thinking. So the other area that we're going to share with you is with regards specific territories. Um, and thinking about the, we know other professions use the term myofascial release. Well, we want to be a little bit more specific <clears throat> and identify the territories within the myofascia that we work. So some of these are the bony attachments, like the rami of the ischial tuberosities, the intermuscular septa, as I've already mentioned, for instance, between the adductors or fascial planes like the superficial back line. Um, excuse me. <coughs> so while I grab a drink, I want you to think about if there's any specific territories that you work with your hands. Pop them in the chat. Great to see some uh, numbers climbing there on the chat. That's great. I can't actually see it at the moment. So moving along, active client engagement is quite a um, unique uh, aspect of structural integration. Um, and with our hands, we can limit local and superficial tissues and areas whilst we have our client activating the more deeper and core structures. 
We also have um, the pelvic work, the pelvic lift that we integrate at the end of sessions. Um, some professions do similar work. Um, I believe the, the pelvic lift um, has an osteopathic uh, origin. But being clear with how we perform, what our hand is doing when we ask for this movement um, is key to finding the similarities and the differences. So for, day, for today, we selected these examples of actions, direction, territories, and client engagement to share with you. There is so much more, hence this conversation with you all out there. So we hope this gives you an idea of how we've started to define the action of our hands so that we can better describe what we do for research. So keep the cogs thinking. Keep putting some thoughts in the chat box. And I'm going to now hand over to Eric. Problem is, I can't hear anybody. Eric, this is Liz. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> now, let's see if I can get this thing back to the beginning. Okay. Can I make this little box go away? There we go. So this is topic two, hypothesize therapeutic mechanisms, and we'll get into what that means. Can't get myself this, okay. That doesn't make it change. Okay, so first I wanna talk about the conference a bit more. Uh, because there's some points, David made them very well, and I'm going to repeat them because we really want to get to get as many people as possible to understand what we are trying to do. What's the motivation of the conference? David talked about this. I want to talk about it again for a bit. What are the aims of the conference and what are not our aims? What are we not trying to do? This is equally important. And within topic two, I'm going to talk about therapeutic mechanisms. I'm going to talk about mechanistic cascades and hypotheses. What are those three things? And then at the end, I'm going to talk about hypothesized therapeutic mechanisms of structural integration. And along the way, why is any of this important? I mean, why pay attention to it? So motivation for the conference. As David described, Paul Stanley and Brian Degenhart realized there was a big problem. Because these five manual therapy professions have very different languages, the research literatures don't reference each other. It's very difficult for a researcher from one of these traditions to understand the literature of a different tradition. Lots of confusion. What's the solution? Develop a common research language. Not e much easier said, very briefly said, but it's taken us two years to get to this point, and this is just the beginning. But if we could do that, there'd be much better communication among researchers in all the different five areas. What would be the advantages? We'd understand each other better. We could collaborate. There could be research projects with osteopaths and PTs and structural integrators working together. There'd be more progress in research findings. And in a way, the bottom line for us would be the credibility of structural integration would increase. 
in hospitals and clinics and among the public. I always like to give the example of acupuncture. The first school of acupuncture in the US started the same year the Rolf Institute was founded, 1972. Acupuncture is now in many hospitals and clinics. It's taught to MDs, it's practiced by MDs. Structural integration is not. What's the difference? The difference is research. There's been a ton of clinical trials and mechanistic research done about acupuncture. It's not been done for structural integration. So we are not taken seriously. David is an exception. He's got it. And there's, there's been a few Rolfers that got to work in biomedical institutions, but it's very rare. And that's why, because we don't have enough research. What is the conference not doing? This is very important to understand. We are not, we are not defining structural integration. That's a whole other thing. That's a holistic thing. We're developing a language just for research purposes. We're not getting in the way of anybody who wants to describe structural integration in any other way. And it needs to be described in other ways, philosophically, spiritually, socially, energetically. We're not doing any of those. We're just working on a language for research purposes. Here's where we draw the line. And even with that goal, we are not finalizing the research language. We're beginning a very long conversation that's going to go on for years. And this conversation has to go on within our own community. It has to go on between us and the other manual therapy professions. It is a great opportunity for us that we have been included, that Brian and Paul included us in this project on an equal footing with the other four professions. And if we pursue this, then it's going to raise our status to the same level. For this conference that's going to happen in May of 2022, we're only talking about physiological mechanisms. We're not doing psychological, social, or energy mechanisms because that, that literature is just even more gigantic. So we're just limiting ourselves to physiology. What is a therapeutic mechanism? It is now this looks a little difficult, but I'm going to illustrate it for you. It's a specific kind of physiological process that's set in motion by a specific therapeutic intervention, which then produces a specific kind of health benefit. Specific, specific, specific. Not just, oh, we lean on them and they get better. <laughs> no, that's not a mechanism. And it's not even, oh, I make their, uh, and make their bodies line up with gravity and they feel better. That's not a mechanism. What is a mechanism? Now, I know you might object that I have this square symptom here because we classically say we do not work on symptoms, but in actual practice, we often do work on symptoms. But for the purposes of illustrating, I'm putting the symptom box there. Somebody has a reason to come to you, to come to any therapist. The therapist makes an intervention. There's a health benefit, hopefully. What's happening in between? Therapeutic mechanism answers the question of what is happening in between. That's the mechanism. In this conference, we're considering three types of therapeutic mechanisms. They're all physiological, as I said. Biomechanical, neurological, and biological. And now I'm going to illustrate those three kinds for you. Here is a biomechanical mechanism. You see on the left there, the general. On the right, the specific example. Somebody has shoulder joint pain and dysfunction due to rotator cuff problems. Typical prescription, which I've had myself because I have shoulder problems. You go to the PT, it gives you shoulder rotation exercises. What's the mechanism? They stimulate the supra and infraspinatus, the muscles that are integral to the rotator cuff, to get thicker and more elastic and work better. And there's reduced pain and dysfunction. Now, a later slide, I'm going to make the point. Now, here we're giving a biomechanical mechanism. 
we have to understand that any mechanism can be described at different levels. This is a biomechanical level. We're just saying those muscles grow and get more elastic, but you could clearly ask on a deeper level, what's happening histologically? What's happening in the tissues? Why do those exercises stimulate those tissues to change in those ways? Then you could ask an even deeper question. Well, what's happening on the cellular level? And then you could say, well, what's happening on the molecular level? And then you could say, well, what's happening on the genetic level? So for any mechanism, there's multiple different kinds of levels that you can go to. A neurological mechanism, chronic neck pain, high velocity, low amplitude adjustments to the vertebra. That's the bollywick of the chiropractors. Mechanism, reduced pressure on the nerve, reduced pain. Again, reduced pressure on the nerve is a neurological explanation, but you could say, well, what's actually happening in the tissue of the nerve? What part of the nerve is changed, is getting better because or more functional because the pressure is reduced? Then you could say, well, what's happening in the, how the actual molecules dancing around to make that change? Well, what's the genetic dimension of that? Biological mechanism, osteoarthritic knee pain. This also I'm familiar with. One approach is glucosamine sulfate tablets. I've been taking them for years. It's known that glucosamine sulfate, which is the molecule that's in your knee anyway, it just declines as you age, like many things. <laughs> if you supplement it, it increases the repair of knee cartilage, reduce pain. If I skip my glucosamine sulfate for more than two or three days, my knees start to ache. So those are examples. I already talked about the levels. Most therapeutic mechanisms can be understood at more than one level biomechanical, histological, immunological, neurological, biochemical, molecular, genetic, epigenetic is how the genetics are expressed. Now, this is an important idea, mechanistic cascades. It's not always the case that between the intervention and the benefit, there's just one mechanism. Sometimes you activate one mechanism and that triggers a second mechanism. And cascades can even go on to more than two mechanisms. We're going to get more specific about this later on. What is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a theory that has been neither affirmed nor disconfirmed by scientific evidence. And that in a science game, that generally means quantitative evidence. So is the earth flat or round? Even the Greeks collected quantitative evidence. They looked at the angles of the sun's shadow at different latitudes to prove that the earth was not flat. Most scientific research is driven by specific hypotheses. If you're writing a research proposal, you start out with the hypothesis that you want to test. If you don't have a hypothesis, you almost never get funding. So hypotheses are very important. And so they're important for us if we're interested in structural integration research. How are hypothesized therapeutic mechanisms helpful? Why pay attention to them? They inform research agendas. If you have a specific hypothesis, you can start to ask questions. Which ones are higher priorities than other ones? Which ones can you measure? If you can't measure it, you can't do a research project on it, not a scientific research project. You can then look at the literature. Has research already been done on this? Was the evidence for it or against it? How is your project going to improve on that record? Now, what are the benefits? If you confirm a mechanism, there are tremendous benefits. This again, the, the example of acupuncture. Acupuncture is in so many hospitals and so many clinics because there is a confirmed therapeutic mechanism. It's called diffuse noxious inhibition. It's a neurological mechanism. It's been experimentally confirmed. And because there is a confirmed mechanism, it's everywhere. MDs can use it for all kinds of things. 
Also, if there's a confirmed mechanism, you get much more research funding because the funders figure their money's not going to be wasted. Also, I just made the point about acupuncture. The contrast is sometimes drawn between the prevalence of acupuncture in biomedical institutions and the absence of homeopathy. There actually are a very large number of positive clinical trials for homeopathy. You don't find homeopaths, homeopathy being practiced by MDs. Why? Because there's no credible mechanism, not credible to materialistic science. So if we can find a credible physiological mechanism or mechanisms for structural integration, that will have a great impact, not just in hospitals and clinics, but the public. Even though we hear a lot about people who do not believe in science anymore, most of the public takes science seriously. And if we have scientific credibility, then we have more clients than we can deal with. We need even more training institutes. Okay, now I'm going to go through hypothesized mechanistic cascades for structural integration. It's going to start simple. It's going to get a bit complex, but hopefully not too complex. And these are some of the mechanisms hypothesized that you'd come up with. They're not proven. They're hypotheses. They need to be researched. So we start with the manual intervention. Immediately, there's a short, short term shift from gelatin to solution in the ground substance. This was known very well in Dr. Rolf's day, even when she was just a biochemist before she even developed Rolf. It was well known that colloids have this property and that the ground substance of fascia is colloidal. That if you add energy to it, it becomes more fluid. The problem is, how does that short-term change lead to a long-term increase in soft tissue elasticity and a reduction in fibrosis? We all know from our clinical experience that we produce long-term changes. It's not because of the immediate change in the ground substance, because that goes away in minutes as soon as the, the system recovers from the pressure. So this is something that has to be researched. Okay, we have long-term increase in the elasticity. Now, we all know you have to be strategically judicious where you apply this. If you're good and you work around a joint, you improve that joint's elasticity. You improve its balance, left to right, front to back. You improve its range of motion and you improve the alignment of the bony parts. That has to do with how skillful you are in applying your hands to the joint. Now we're already to the fourth mechanism. If you improve joint alignment and elasticity, you can reduce nerve impingement, you can reduce stress on the cartilage, you can reduce cartilage damage, and you can thereby reduce inflammation. Plausible, right? But we have to prove it. <laughs> it's not proven. Health benefit, reduced chronic musculoskeletal pain and disability. The World Health Organization every five years publishes a census of the global burden of disability. By each country, they rank the economic cost of disabilities. Musculoskeletal pain and disability is always in the top three. It's a major thing, it's not well treated. If we can prove some of these mechanistic links, we can't possibly satisfy the demand that would arise for our services. Okay, now here's another third tier cascade. And this is one that's important to all of us. This is Dr. Ralph's basic message in a way, is that there are, are ideals of posture and movement, verticality, symmetry, grace and movement, and that if we move a human body towards those ideals, we get a reduction in musculoskeletal pain and disability. We get improved energy efficiency. She talked about this all the time. We get reduced muscular tension because life is easy if you're vertical. It's easier if you're vertical than if you're stooped. It's easier if you're symmetrical than if one side's a lot shorter than the other. 
it's easier if your movements are fluid and graceful. Now, the blue are biomechanical mechanism you see in the legend here at the lower left hand corner. I'm going to talk about some neurological mechanisms. Manual intervention. Now, this is currently Robert Schleip has written a lot about this. It's confirmed by the anatomist that there are a lot of nerve endings in fascia. Most of them are mechanoreceptors. That is, they respond to mechanical pressure. One of Robert's hypotheses is, there are, is that one of the reasons that people get more relaxed and flexible from structural integration is these mechanoreceptors interact somehow with autonomic nerves in the fascia. There are also autonomic nerves in the fascia, such that there's an increase of parasympathetic to sympathetic innovation. Remember, parasympathetic is being relaxed and happy. Sympathetic is being alarmed or pissed off, and either you're running or you're fighting. So Robert's hypothesis is that the pressure on these mechanoreceptors has this effect of shifting us towards the parasympathetic. There's also an earlier hypothesis. John Cottingham published a couple of articles about changes in heart rate variability from Rolfing. Heart rate variability is tied very closely to the parasympathetic sympathetic balance. Benefits. If we're shifted, shifted toward the parasympathetic, we're less anxious, we're less irritable. And if our heart rate variability improves, this is a major, gigantic area of research. There are all kinds of health benefits. Just about every dimension of a person's life gets better if their heart variability improves. Now, we're going to go through a different, a little bit more complicated cascade to get to another neurological hypothesis. We all know and believe, and it's a key tenant of structural integration, that once you increase the elasticity in enough areas of the body, it starts to spread. And that contributes to the approximation of our ideals. It also contributes to stimulation of the stretch receptors in the tendons and origins of muscles. Dr. Rolf talked about this a lot. The Golgi receptors are very dense in where muscles attach to bone, tendons and origins. Dr. Rolf talked a lot about how if those bony attachments are rigid, those receptors don't get stimulated. Then the cerebellum, the motor part of your brain, does not know what's going on with the tension level and the stretch in those structures. And she talked about the fact that if you increase the elasticity in those structures, then the Golgi receptors get stimulated, they start talking to the cerebellum, you get improved neuromotor coordination. Hypotheses, lots of research to confirm that. Now I'm going to go, go through one last cascade that will lead us to a biological mechanism. If you, Dr. Rolf talked a lot about the fact, her hypothesis, that if you improve the elasticity of the tissue and reduce the fibrosis, you improve the migration of fluid through the fascia. She used to quote some research that 60% of the fluid movement through the body was migration through the fascia. I don't know what the figure is these days, but it's a lot. And it makes sense, it's plausible, that if the fascia is like a sheet of aluminum or like a sheet of cement board, there's not a lot of fluid moving through it. That's a hypothesis though, we have to prove it. But what happens if the fluid moves through the fascia? Increased clearance of pain amplifiers and pro-inflammatory molecules from the interstitial fluid. Dr. Rolf thought that if the fluid moved more freely, there was a nutritional advantage. She talked about this a lot. It's difficult these days to think that that's a very big effect. 
that there's not much more nutrition happening in the blood flow than by this fluid in the that moves through the interstitial fluid. But there's very good research now that shows that in the interstitial fluid, there are molecules called cytokines that turn up inflammation. And there are other molecules called nociceptive amplifiers that cause nerves to send pain messages. So we know that they're in there, but it's a scientific problem to prove that if we improve the elasticity of the tissue and the fluid moves through it, that those things get cleared out better. And if they do, that would reduce chronic muscular, musculoskeletal pain and disability. So I'm just going to leave this up here. Just so your eye can wander through these pathways. We have the biomechanical pathways in blue. We have four levels of cascades. We have the benefits in orange. In the red, we have a few neurological mechanisms. This is not a comprehensive chart. There are other neurological mechanisms that we've even talked about in our group, but I, this is complicated enough. I didn't wanna make it impossible. And we have in purple, a biological mechanism. Please in the chat, comment on these, question them, challenge them. And as we have questions and comments, we can go back to this or any of the other slides. So just to wrap it up, review it, we're trying to develop a common research language across manual therapy professions, a research language. We're not trying to define structural integration in any other way than for research purposes. We talked about therapeutic mechanisms, biomechanical, neurological, biological. We've talked about mechanistic cascades and we've illustrated a lot of them. We talked about the different levels at which a mechanism can be analyzed. We talked about hypotheses, why they're important. And we talked about hypotheses, hypothesized therapeutic mechanisms of structural integration. So we can go back to any of these. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you, Eric, and thank you, Bernie. Uh, I'm back, and just to kind of wrap this up before we open it back to you, whoops, hang on a second. There we go. That's better. Space, the final frontier. No. Okay, uh, along, so everything you've just heard about, uh, we are going to continue to work and develop, as are the other professions that I outlined in the beginning of the afternoon. Now, we're creating a mind map, which is a graphic like you see before you, uh, based on what you just heard about. This is, a, this is a visual and graphic tool that some people use to understand these things. And of course, it's part of a much larger mind map that includes uh, the other five disciplines as outlined earlier in the talk. We're going to publish white papers. We're going we're gonna to keep moving this forward in a really, really measured academic way. And we're also going to have a conference. And I want to tell you a little bit about this conference and some of what's going to make it special, even, even more special, along with the first of its kind. Um, keynote speakers uh, is going to be Dr. Ara Nielsen, who actually runs a center for sensory motor interaction uh, in Aalborg University in the EU. We're going to have the director of the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, Helen Langevin, who has done more groundbreaking research on the mechanisms, on what's going on under the skin. She's the one, to go back to what Eric was saying about acupuncture, who was able to, the, there's a phenomenon acupuncturists talk about. We have our own phenomenons about what we feel going on underneath uh, what we feel with our hands going on underneath the surface. Acupuncturists talk about this sensation that the needle is actually being pulled into the body when they insert it. Um, she actually showed on ultrasound that the collagen fibers in the fascial net will 
actually do that. They will wind around the needle like spaghetti on a fork and go and suck it in. So that very fine palpation that they have to be able to feel that, that's not something they're making up. These are the kinds of exciting things that, that I hope are going to be generated for decades to come out of the work that we've been doing here that we're just beginning with over the last few years as part of the inter consortium of manual therapies. We have all of these sponsors coming to the event. Uh, as you can see, there's some pretty major names in structural integration right there. And um, here's the really special thing. I know we spent two years spending a lot of time in this medium, this Zoom medium, and we were so looking forward to having an in-person event. And the executive committee made the decision earlier this year, particularly with people coming from the EU and everywhere else, that it just was, it was just maybe a little bit too soon. This was not an easy decision to make at all, but we did. But I want to share with you what we're doing instead, because you've never been to a conference like this. So this whole thing is going to take place with Zoom interaction like this, but it's gonna take place in a virtual conference hall, which we are still building, particularly uh, Jeff, who's on the call today. So you see there my name and I'm not wearing a mask. That's supposed to be my beard. So I have an official crap beard for this. Uh, and you see connecting to the destination ICMT. So this is going to be our conference center. And there I am, I've just come into the room. And um, I'm going to walk around a little bit using my arrow keys. That's the information kiosk. The information kiosk will be manned person to the entire time. And you're going to be able to walk around in through this virtual conference space. Oh, look, there's one of our sponsors. I'm going to wander in there and see, press X to become a member. Or, oh, press X and sign up for swag. I'm going to do that. I'm going to press my X. And here I am. And there's what I need to fill out. So our vendors our sponsors, they're all going to have these interactive booths that are going to have lots of things for you to discover, explore, and do with. Now, the auditorium was down that way. We're still, we're still building that, but you'll be able to sit down next to your colleagues. Here's the breakout rooms where you can have smaller meetings with other professionals in your own profession or other ones. Here's our grotto where you're going to be able to have uh, stretch breaks, yoga breaks, guided meditations. We're going to have videos here that you can go and click on and do those things anytime. And as you can see, you're going to get your steps in. So don't worry about that. And I know it's always a great thing about conference is we be sure to get our steps in. I'm going to go check out the poster hall next. Uh, and here I go. So the other thing is I was going to win here at the time, but you'll see the names of the other people. You can strike up conversations that you'll have with them on Zoom in real time. You can go in one of these private rooms and do that. Here's the poster room. We're going to have the posters set up so that you can go and view them at any time with little mini movies. So we've just got these little placeholders here for now, but this is a way that you're going to have to view the posters and the presenters of the posters anytime. Uh, there's also, this is one of my favorite things here, um, in terms of interaction, whoops, in terms of interaction is uh, the gaming space. And the movie doesn't seem to be playing. I have been, I have been, uh, there it goes. You know, there was just a big long pause. So you're going to be able to interact with people in real time. We're going to have things set up where if you want to go ask the osteopath, you can do that and have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue or a multi-person dialogue with an osteopath or a physical therapist, ask them questions. Here's the gaming room. We're going to have Yes, I found the poker room. You want to play poker with some of your buddies at the conference? You can come to the gaming room and do that. We have a lot of other different kinds of games too. Word games, Jenga. I don't know if we have Jenga, but stuff like that. So we're trying to make this just as fun as it possibly can be in a live real-time environment. And this is going to be available for one month. So this is going to be a phenomenal opportunity, not just for the participants, but for the vendors and everybody else to be able to hold virtual events that you can come and join at any time during that month long period. Now, there are some key dates. Uh, the 5th of May is our welcome reception and our social hour. And then the actual first two days of the conference are the 6th and 7th of May. And we've decided, as you can see, that they're not going to be longer than six hours. And there's two generous 30 to 45 minute breaks woven in to that six hour time block. And then 
Two weeks later, we're going to have days three and four. Uh, topics one and two are going to be parts of days one and two. And topic three is going to be part of days three and four. And we've got this incredible virtual conference space that will be there for you to enjoy and use for an entire month. It's a really unique proposition for a really unique consortium on manual therapies. Uh, I see we have 45 people here participating. Thank you. That is a fantastic turnout. And I think we're all really, really pleased to see that. And now we're going to turn it over to Liz and begin the discussion portion. Okay, thanks, David. Well, I also want to thank everybody for being here. And a number of you have commented on the side on the chat box. And if you're not familiar with the chat box, it's at the bottom of your panel and you may want to look and read uh, what a number of folks have written in. But before we go through the comments, I wanted to go back to you, Bernie, if that's okay. Uh, trying to find you on my screen, <clears throat> because there were a number of uh, people, hi, that wrote in about your topic, and I, and I was wondering if you'd like to address any of that. Uh, thanks, Liz. Yes, absolutely. Um, if I can touch on you know, those that commented, one of the, the themes that came through with several people um, when we talked about hands was using perhaps the, the terminology instruments. Um, and uh, I think Cody suggested, you know, physical instrument of the practitioner. Um, and, you know, I guess while we're talking about what we're doing with our hands, um, the other professions, and it's not something that we've included, but there are techniques that are, I guess, applied by instruments. Um, and so a lot of the other professions have that category. So that's something that we'll consider in terms of our wording. Um, to address how we describe our tools, <laughs> perhaps. Um, there were other comments um, in terms of, you know, looking, permission, listening, that sort of thing. And, you know, we've taken all of that into consideration in those six elements that we um, identified at the start. I'd really like to address, there were three people that talked about directional um, application. And um, apologies if I don't pronounce your name right, but um, Valisha, you wrote about spiraling. And I'd just like to ask, are you talking about spiraling into the tissues? So if you could just unmute yourself and uh, speak to that for a moment. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, as we were talking and listening, that's what came up to me. Uh, I like doing a lot of dural neural modulation techniques and I've done different um, uh, volumetric uh, techniques too. I see Juan David is here and it just, I can't explain it. It's not a shearing and it's not, but I use my hands in such a multi-dimensional way that I like the only word that comes to me is a spiral because as you ease into the tissue and you follow the pattern and I, I feel like I'm talking with the body and I'm going with the breath and you cue for movement and it does feel like a spiral like I don't know how to explain it and whether it's you know around the bone attachments or it's in through the viscera because I love organ work so then it kind of comes in and you can weave so to me my hands do feel like they spiral like and of course your whole arm but I just, I just love the spiral yeah. effect that it feels. That's great. Hey, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Brendan, uh, you mentioned rotational and twist. Could you say a little bit more about that, please? Um, I would say that it's, it's very similar. Well, first of all, can, can you, everybody hear me? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so very similar to what the last individual had spoken about, 
um, I, I can, uh, I can relate to what she had uh, just said. And, uh, the image that I had in mind was very similar to that. It's kind of like, a, it's almost like a torsion for me. Um, uh, but it's, it's more of a spiral type mo motion. Okay. All right. That's great. Thanks, Brendan. And Kathleen, you mentioned about a wave. Could you speak to that for me? Have we still got Kathleen with us? Her name is there. Is that Kathleen Rooney? She unmuted. Uh, she's not. Uh, now I'm not muted. Okay, Kathleen, thank you. Hi, well, Kathleen. I missed a few minutes. I uh, went upstairs to get lunch. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, nothing to <laughs> apologize right. for. I'm looking forward to that in about another hour myself. Yeah. Can you just speak to the wave direction that you wrote in the chat? Wave? I'm sure you wrote wave in the chat. Take a quick look. Yeah, I wrote fixotropy. I wrote uh, phase change. Is that what we're talking about? So you huh? wrote in there, uh, and I can read it, uh, Bernie. To Thank put you. a way to put a way. Oh, that. Okay, that one. Yes. Okay. The tissue. Yeah. All right. Um, so, what would you like me to talk about? So that's actually not even my idea. That is originally um, Neil Powers was one of my teachers. And that is how he described uh, the work that we do. He says, you put a waveform into a body. It's, um, and then Fourier transform analysis, uh, something bounces back. You touch the body, a waveform goes in, something bounces back. You interpret what's bouncing back and you interact with your interpretation. And, okay. and it, the fact that it's an interpretation is always true because two people will feel exactly the same thing interpret it differently, interact with it differently, and both can provide uh, successful results. So you're talking about the wave as being a reaction or a response to touch, what you're doing with your hands. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Brilliant. Great. Okay. Um, and I just want to acknowledge those that wrote about the, um, the different territories you know, our, our list was not inclusive of, of everything. Um, and so thank you for adding those. Um, Laurie, um, could you speak about the inner auricular space a little? Um, hi, I just unmuted myself. Yeah, um, uh, I work a lot in the ears and I have been working a lot with people with uh, vertigo conditions and concussions and they see it seems to really bring them up over the hump and when I started doing the work many years ago I thought that's how the work was done but come to find out um, it might be kind of a new thing that I'm very excited about <laughs> so I call it the candy wrapper technique where I go in and form a um, yeah, I, I don't know. I put my pinkies in people's ears and their ears just kind of suck me in and then suddenly it stops. And um, speaking of a spiral, I mean, the body loves spirals. I, I equate working on anything else in the body and spirals kind of like opening up a tight pickle jar. Um, but um, so I, I go in with my fingers and I stop and then I just feel for where the hard candy is in the head, which is kind of a energetic kerfuffle of, I think, where the, um, w you know, where the vertigo problem is, you know, Meniere's disease and things like that. And mm -hmm. I just imagine it's a hard candy and then I hook in to the inner auricular fascia and gently pull. And it feels actually like a hard candy is being unwrapped. And after right. that, there's much more space in the head. And I've added a new thing probably a couple of years ago where I have the client work inside their mouth while I'm in their ears. So it creates like this three dimensionality to it. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a couple of case studies uh, going on with it right now. And it's, it's very exciting and kind of cool. Great. 
Hey, well, look, Laurie, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'm sure there's uh, lots of us out there that work in different ways like this. And also great to hear that you've got some case studies because we, we need more case studies. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, and I think probably just the one last thing to mention is that where I talked just a moment ago with regards hands and instruments, we all are also looking at osseous and non-osseous. So we didn't give those examples today, um, but we have considered what osseous structures that um, we work with our hands. Um, anyway, I'm going to hand back to Liz. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Bernie. And thanks, you guys, for responding. I want to just back up one moment just to frame our uh, the rest of our time together. We have 50, 50 minutes left together. And I just also would like to invite anyone that isn't showing their face on screen, if you'd like to, you know, we all work very independently and, and we're alone. And sometimes it's nice just to see other faces. So if you feel like popping in, even if it's for a moment, yeah, great. It's, it's nice to see a lot of you folks that, hey, Richie, um, that you might just want to say hello. There's, there's, it's a nice feeling to connect. So we will be here um, for 50 more minutes. It's really helpful that if you don't want to ask a question, that if you're having a thought to pop it into the chat, because often if you have a thought, someone else may have the exact same thought and you're both sitting there uh, not wanting to come in. So the safest way is to just put it in the chat and uh, we'll see it. And hopefully one of us will be able to talk about it. So with what Bernie was presenting, and, and I believe that her presentation as the beginning, talking about uh, what is it that we're doing with our hands? Is there anything else that you guys would like to put in that chat or unmute yourself specific to that question? even if it may not make sense to you. Like one of the things I was thinking of and that was the, the angle that we use our elbow with, the vectoring. And even though I might sit here thinking, well, I don't know if that's really something that would be helpful to throw in there. I'm just gonna put it there because you never know where the idea can be helpful for the committee down the road. So um, David, you, David Lasondak, uh, you wrote to me about uh, intention. Would you like to speak on that for a moment? And you're muted, David. I, I don't know if you can hear David that you're muted. Sorry, sorry, I just, I, I forgot. Um, a couple of people directly mentioned intentions. I think a few other people in the chat box implied intention. And um, I just wanted to highlight that um, an area for future collaborative discussion is to separate both the physical and the intentional energies. And that's something we definitely hope to have in the second conference a few years down the road. So, you know, this is, this is to reiterate what we said from the beginning, this is just the starting point of something that's going to go on for a long time. And I also want to highlight uh, one of the most fascinating bits of research that I found out recently, which was an MRI brain study. Uh, and I won't get into the specifics of it, but they actually did uh, imaging of the person touching the other person. And they found that the person being touched, different areas of their brain lit up when the touchy was focused on the person rather than when that person was distracted by uh, a series of beeps, they were told to put their intention on something else. But when they put the intention on the person, it lit up different areas of the brain. So th there's room for this discussion. And we're just, we're just starting it. Great. Now I noticed, thank you, David, that uh, Robert Tepork, your, your hand was up. And if you'd like to unmute and if you would, in the context of what we're speaking about with languaging and what we're doing with our hands, if that's what you were raising your hand on, we'd love to hear more about that. Uh, that was not what I was gonna talk about. I was gonna talk about the social significance of rolfing. 
versus the individual significance and the uh, importance of working on whole families versus working on individuals. That would be great. Do you think you could um, speak to that briefly so that there's room for everyone else who has questions and, and take a minute or so for that? I can. So I um, have been working on whole families for a long time and realized that patterns of tension that an individual client comes to us with has only somewhat to do with that individual, but it has to do with their family structure and the things that have happened to them in going along the way. And I have an illustration and a picture of four women that's four generations in the same family that talk about the persistence of uh, patterns of posture over generations. So that's not something I hear very many people in the structural integration field talking about. And um, and so when we're working on people individually, we're also impacting their relationship with their family. Robert, can I just say um, absolutely agree with you? Um, and that's actually from a, a structural integration uh, viewpoint that I've written a book about how it's so important to um, work with children and babies very early on and give them opportunities um, and to invite parents uh, to sort themselves out so that their uh, children don't uh, copy or uh, mimic the patterns um, as they grow. So that's great, great to hear. I'll just give you one, one recent example. Uh, a friend of mine, I roughed him and his whole family and been roughing them for many years. His daughter had a baby recently last year and the baby was born with a detached esophagus and was in and out of ICU in and out of whether she was going to live or not and that all that tension accumulated in the body of both parents and so I ended up working on the baby she's doing remarkably better I worked on the mother and I worked on the father and they're doing remarkably better and lots of things in their lives and their bodies have changed so um, I've got hundreds of other examples of that. So um, what can I tell you? I'd love to hear, I'd love to find your book. So if you could send me a link to it, I'd love that, okay? So, so hearing Robert's um, experience, I'm guessing many of us have worked with generations of, uh, in a family and, and some have not, but even just tuning into your own practice with the idea that we're here to find this language for research purposes. What else is, are you, what else are you thinking about, even if you find that it may not pertain to what we're talking about, but it's coming up for you right now. For example, uh, and I hope I pronounce your name correctly, uh, Valisha, I hope that's correct. Um, you put in something about how you are working with space and and tension and the tension in between the spaces. And I know you mentioned you were having trouble putting your thoughts into words, but I don't know if you've had a little more time and you'd like to say something about uh, languaging and, and how you touch. I guess my background is nursing, so it was really scientific. So when I've always lived in both worlds and then being in this type of setting, we're trying to find more scientific research-based things. It's like, I do struggle with being in a chiropractic clinic and referring to and from physiotherapists and they want the languaging of modern medicine. And that's what I, I am struggling with trying to figure out telling them and educating, you know, the other practitioners, what it is I'm doing. They can see the impact, but they're not really clear on what is it she's doing even. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I do enjoy being a part of this community. It's like, we need better, clear languages and, um, you know, there is something magical about what we do. And I don't want everything full of science, but I do feel, you know, to, the credibility and how do we do move forward research has its role and big place absolutely you know you're, you're stating something that i find interesting you use the word magical and research in one sentence and this, this work 
does have both of those components and many others. So while, while you were speaking, did anyone have a thought and would like to jump in and add to the conversation? Because yes, yeah, Katya, I, now I see your hand. <laughs> and you're muted. Yeah, um, I actually just let sink in what Laurie had said about her work in the inner ear. And I think it's just such a beautiful um, example of how important this discussion that we're having today is, because as she was talking about the, the areas that she works in that we're as a group trying to kind of pinpoint or kind of, kind of formulate final language for, um, what came to my mind was that the inner ear is innervated by the vagal nerve. So any kind of parasympathetic um, mechanism could make sense in what she's describing. So it's just like, we're finding a language, we're defining the territory, and then this would be part of our topic one. And this directly leads into what Eric has described, finding um, a mechan mechanism or at least a hypothesis for mechanism there, because to my mind, it just, popped and was like, oh, okay, maybe that could have to do with a vagal nerve or not, but we're starting to find a language where we can, um, yeah, hypothesize and then potentially put into a research project um, at some point. So that is something that is just a beautiful example of why we're talking today and how important this discussion is. And I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I think that's very, very helpful. We have two other people who have raised their hand, Libby. Would you like to unmute for a moment? Nice to see you too. Good to see you. Um, Liz used to live in the same town I do. That's so we've known each other a while. Um, when uh, I think it was David was talking earlier about when um, you, you put electrodes on the client, when the practitioner's attention is on the client, things light up in the brain. I have always wanted to have those electrodes on both people because there's something simultaneously. I know you've all had the experience. I say, well, so-and-so is happening. And they say, how did you know that? Something's happening both places. And I think this is really important. And it, it's one of those magical things, but I think it has a physiological neurological basis. So I would love to add that to the mix. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Uh, that's what I think was so great about that particular study. It's like for the first time we were able to image intention. That's exciting. And I think too, thanks. Um, Kirsten actually put a comment about uh, touching and being touched. Um, so on the same wavelength as you, Libby. So thanks, Kirsten. Kirsten. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. Bernie, you froze for a moment. Could you repeat that? Uh, I was just saying that... Um, Kirsten, and if I pronounce your name wrong, I apologize, um, in the chat also brought up the um, aspect of touching and being touched um, as a key component. Um, so it's good that we've got all of these people coming in with their thoughts. Can I just react on that? <laughs> sure, please. But, um, actually, that was um, in the same person, like this, that you to touch something and to open the channel both ways. But I think this other thing with the simultaneous, that's very, fun. That's very fascinating. But for me, it was in the same person. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. Is there anybody who has not said something who would really like to? And this I is think Laurie has her hand up. I have not seen the hand. Oh, there it is. Lori, yeah. Hi. And Lori, you were also asked a question, by the way, if the vertigo goes away. So I just want yeah. to throw that in also. Yes. Um, the, vag the vagus nerve definitely has something to do with it. And yes, the vertigo does go away. Um, I think it was like 15 or 16 years ago, I had a woman with absolute diehard Meniere's disease. She was not, unable to function. And I had Rolfed her probably, well, structural integrated her, sorry. Um, well, uh, probably like 10 years before that or eight years before that, something like that. So she, she said, can you work on me? I said, yeah, and we did the ear thing. And she hasn't had a recurrence of her Meniere's disease since that. 
which is pretty miraculous. Um, so that's that's what was the impetus to do more studies. And she she keeps wanting me to get the word out there on like Meniere's blog sites and stuff. But you know, there's a lot of questions about it. Like, um, does it work on people who have just gone through a series, or can you do it randomly on just a random body? I don't know. So, yeah, it's it's pretty powerful stuff. And um, I, I should say too, that I integrate a lot of things to set up for getting into the ear. Um, uh, you know, Tom Meyer's deep frontal neckline stuff and, and Sharon Wheeler's uh, cranial torque stuff. And um, there, there's a lot of things to do to set up to make the head really right to go in and do the ear work. So, um, and Sharon's actually incorporating it in her work, her inner bone work workshops. So we'll see where that goes. <laughs> and and if you come up with any uh, languaging that's specific that you can remember about Sharon's work or Tom's or anyone else you've studied mm -hmm. with, be sure to throw that into the chat. So Alyssa, Alyssa, I don't know if you can hear me, Alyssa Dotson, and you are muted. Um, you you me? had a okay. question. Yep. Hey, Alyssa, it's good to see you too. Hi, and um, you had a question and I'm wondering um, after you ask if uh, possibly Eric could be on call to answer this one. Go ahead, Alyssa. Thank you, Liz. Um, first of all, thank you everybody. Um, kept coming back in my mind and following Liz's lead, don't, don't know if this is for this particular conference or the next one um, regarding the integrative aspect of our work and how what I'm hearing people saying they did a few steps before they were able to get to a certain result with somebody else. And on a very unscientific personal experience, I've worked with all the modalities that have been listed um, and they all are very helpful, but I have a very different sensation when I receive a structural integrative session, which is a full integrative grounded feeling um, that makes me feel, for lack of a better word, whole or present, where if I get acupuncture or osteopath, I have a very different, wonderful feeling and healing aspects, but it's but the structural integration part is unique, the integration to me as a practitioner and a receiver. So I'm curious where that is um, being, uh, is that being talked about? And is that able to, is that able to go into a research form or question or hypothesis? Great question, Elisa. Uh, when I had the, uh, the diagram of the mechanisms, there was that square that said more closely approximating the posture and movement ideals of SI. I mean, what you're saying is really what Dr. Roth emphasized over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. is that this, the job of the structural integrator is to move the body towards those ideals. Mm -hmm. And maybe individual little problems deserve a bit of manipulation, but if they're chronic, the thing that will help is improve is moving the whole body towards those ideals. Can it be researched? Yes, we have to develop uh, quantitative measures of things like verticality, symmetry. Of course, there is uh, there are motion labs. And when I did my low back pain study, I did it in a motion lab. And you put little mark, little dots on bony landmarks, and there are cameras that watch them as the person moves, and you get wireframe models, and you can measure everything. But uh, can we find the exact measurements of exact parameters to give us a number for how vertically aligned somebody is, how symmetrical they are, how graceful they are? The more that we can do that, if we can do that, what it opens up is structural fitness as a dimension of medicine. Because then we can give a number for the structural fitness of different individuals. We can show that structural integration improves that number. And then we can ask the question, does that number relate to their overall health? That would be a huge deal. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So we have three people with their hands up. Uh, so in this order, I'm gonna start with Cody 
then Richie, and then Kevin, and that's the order y'all came in on. So Cody, if you can unmute and it's all yours. And you are muted, Cody. I thought I unmuted, good to see you again. Um, I had the opportunity a few years ago to go to a um, conference in New York City on um, seizure disorders. And they were just beginning to do, you know, talk about um, acupuncture and its uses. Well, I raised my hand and said, you know, what about structural integration and stuff? And it just sort of, they sort of ignored me, but they're willing to drill a hole in someone's head and give them tons of medication so they can't move at all um, than to listen to this. So the whole point of this for me is, again, it's the integration of the body, the scaffolding of the nerves, um, the opening of the body and the continual movement. In my mind, Rolfing is all about movement. Structural integration is movement. And um, to get that energetic, the nervous system moving, I think is one of the main factors. So I think at some point, um, it would be nice to delve into that more, especially since um, I know a neurologist who says it's not research and he doesn't believe it and he knows everything and reads everything. So it's always been a point of contention with me because there have been a number of um, researches going on. Um, anyway, that's something I think in the future would be lovely to do. And it's a big part of the population. So thank you. Thank you. I, I do also like that you brought in the word integration and how we talk about that uh, and what we're doing with our hands when it comes to integration from a, a languaging and research aspect is another area that if anyone is having any ideas to either raise your hand or, or drop that in the chat. Um, Richie. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so if this is about finding words, finding new words for uh, what we do and how that relates to the world, uh, then I, I need some words. I'm looking for new words. And one of them, um, this whole concept of the therapeutic mechanism. So we put our hands on, on people and something happens and then you get some kind of health benefit. And what I'm, well, I'm looking for the words for exactly what happens in that therapeutic touch. So the question maybe is, what is our therapeutic touch? What is, what is it about this rolfing high touch that we have that is different from every other kind of touching? Um, so when a, a mother pats her, son, her child on the head, that's one kind of touch. If she grabs them by the ear and drags them off, that's another kind of touch. Well, what is unique about our touch that makes an intervention that changes the entire geometry of the body? That's, that's, I'm looking for those words. I've spent my whole you know, career coming up with words. I have a lot that I've uh, worked with, but um, I, I think we need as a society to find these words to describe what it is that, that makes a body change. And I like that whole concept of science and magic. And I've said for many years that Rolfing is a, is a trick, it's a magic trick. But the thing about magic is magic is only magic if you don't know the trick. Behind all magic, there is a trick. And so our therapeutic touch um, takes advantage of the national, natural plasticity of fascia. That we speak directly to the plasticity of fascia in a way that all other touches do not. So, uh, and uh, the last thing I want to mention is that, for example, Alyssa was looking for words that describe what she calls integration and which I call together. I think that our society, as a, as a planet, we have really no idea what a really together body is. And so society has struggled with what it means to be a together body and has mostly come up with the wrong answers, the wrong words. So that's, that's a point of intervention where I think we can contribute to this planet wrapping its mind around the fact that we're a whole planet full of random bodies where nobody knows there are a random body. 
I think uh, we ought to tell them. Thank you. So Richie has brought up some uh, comments about languaging that he wants help with. And I am curious since the word integration uh, has come up several times and I even mentioned it. Often when I work with integration, I pause for a moment because at times with the pause, some information can come in to me that I can work with. So I'm wondering as you guys are sitting here, if you have a, a moment to pause and a word comes up, just pop it in the chat because it's not just Richie that is looking for languaging. I would imagine and, and hope that we all are so that when we're in our practice, regardless of the client that arrives, we have some verbal ability to share with them what it is that we're doing. And that's part of why we're here. I also just want to flag that Libby just uh, wrote something that makes a lot of sense to me, which is internal experience of wholeness um, based on the word integration. And, and Libby, do you want to add anything to that as far as what you were thinking? Yeah, I think a, a person's usual experience of themselves is this is how I am. Yeah. In so many people, and I know you've all heard this in some manner, um, you know, I didn't know I, I didn't know I was tight there. I didn't know I was out of balance there. I didn't, now that I have the contrast, I see it, I feel it, and I feel better. Um, but, but that internal feeling of there's nothing in the way. When I move, everything moves, and it does so fluidly. That internal experience of wholeness, that's not, there's not all those rocks in this dream, so to speak. That's about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I also just want to point out that, David uh, Ronsky, you've been very um, communicative on the chat. And the last thing I saw that I just felt is really worth noting is uh, how do we talk about gravity in our work? And I would like to task the newer practitioners, and I'm going to qualify newer, meaning anyone with 10 years or less in practice. Uh, if you're willing just to toss a word into the chat, and, and I won't pick on you unless you would like to raise your hand, but any words that come to you, because often I've discovered as an educator that the younger generation actually has words that I would like to know. And it's not always the teachers that have the, 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 the wisdom. And, and often we teach because we want to learn and we get to learn from the younger generation. So if any of you, and I know quite a few of you here are, are willing and to take the risk and just toss in a word or two that sits well with you, whether you're 10 years or less or more, uh, it would be very helpful. So Kevin, thank you for your patience. And Kevin McCoy, and if you'd like to unmute, it, you're up. Thank you, Liz. Um, so great to see so many people that I haven't seen in a long time. So great to see some people I've never met before. Um, what a noble enterprise we are all a part of. Uh, my appreciations to the, the group that really has, as I believe Eric, you were saying that you've been working on this for two years to get us to this starting point that we're at. Um, what a noble, noble undertaking, very valuable, very, very challenging. And the the chant that's the part that I want to start talking about is the challenging piece. It's interesting that I believe Alyssa brought up the word integration. Um, and I think that that's one of the challenges that is so germane to the work that we all do is that the work is about integrating. Uh, it is not myofascial release work, which would lend itself in an easier way to scientific inquiry. And that a challenge for us is that we do work that is integrative. And how is it that that will be reflected in the work that we're undertaking? Um, a second piece that also comes to mind for me is, which has been brought up before, of the, the fact that as a practitioner, 
when I'm working with a client, my state has so much to do with what I'm able to feel, perceive, and what I'm able to uh, help facilitate in change. It's again, it's a very different way that typical science looks at it wants to investigate other rather than other and what is the, the practitioner's influence on what's going on. So I think those are some of the, the bigger challenges that we have. And in the chat, I've just, I'll share two other little pieces that are more granular and therefore easier to subject themselves to scientific inquiry. Um, those have to do with I'm very, very interested in the layers within the fascia itself. And as I work, I find myself more and more imagining that I'm working into the um, paramecial layer. And it's that layer where the nervous intervention and the vascular supply reach to the um, the muscles. And so I don't know that I can actually touch that, but I am imagining that I'm, I'm weaving my way into that layer to s facilitate uh, vascular supply and nervous intervention into those deeper parts of our being. And similarly, I'm also very intrigued by the synovial fluids and my belief, again, that I'm, I'm working in a way that is contacting the synovium and actually stimulating uh, synovial fluid production as I'm working. And that there are specific ways that I work to try and uh, elicit these, these reactions that, that I'm imagining I'm working with. So thanks for listening and wonderful to be a part of this community. Well, Kevin, let me just ask you, when you say you're imagining, is there a way that you could think about and maybe get back to us how to use that word imagine and uh, find a, uh, a, another word that might be uh, conducive to working in research when we talk about feeling into or, or imagining? Because I also work with imagination and, and I think it's a tricky word to describe when it comes to science. Yeah. So uh, I'll say something right away about that is that I, I fall on to using that word imagining because I don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, but but I do have some belief as to what's going on. So, for example, when I'm when I'm attempting to affect the synovial fluid, there's a specific way that I'm working that has to do with my my um, my knowledge of anatomy to know the shape of the um, articular surfaces, to work in a way where I'm compressing into that, art those articular surfaces and working to feel the gliding nature into that synovium, uh, synovial space and then slowly coming out of it. So those are, those are beyond my imagining, but my imagining is also a part that helps me to get into that. And I have similar similar anatomical experience around my imagining getting into that peri, um, perimesial layer of the fascia. Uh, and that, that has to do with feeling the septa that is more into the epimesial layer and then following my touch into where I feel harder spaces and softer spaces that now I will use the word imagining that my imagining is that I'm now into that uh, that perimesial space that I'm quite certain is pretty microscopic. So I'm not sure that my fingers are actually able to get there. Thank you. And, and everybody on the call, one thing I wanna mention, uh, because I do know quite a few of you and we come from different schools of thought and we have different ways of interpreting and identifying with the work. Even if there's a word like imagination, uh, that may not make sense for research, I would write it in the chat because there's a possibility that we, as a, as a collective group, whether it's this group or the smaller research group, 
can take that word and find meaning in a way that would be adaptable to the project. So if you have some words that come to you that you think, oh gosh, this would never make sense. I would encourage you just to write it in anyway. It's like brainstorming where we have a lot of ideas and then we can go through it uh, after this call. Uh, so Juan David, you're up next. Nice to see you too. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, just as uh, Kevin was thinking, everyone putting this together out of the same thing. It's great that this is coming together and I appreciate the work that everyone is putting into this. Um, I'm a little, I, I'm a little hesitant to to go into this because I feel like I need to summarize something that I may not be able to do in a very clear and coherent way. Um, but when when it comes to integration, I guess the part that I want to offer is that I, I find that often we try to define it in a very concrete, specific way, right? Like this specific quality or something like this. But when we are working with human beings, we are working with a complex system, right? And integration really comes down more to a quality in the ability to regulate how we relate to other things, right? Like one of those things that we talk about um, regularly is gravity. How do we relate to gravity? But it's not just this static posture of perfect alignment and not moving outside of that alignment. But there are many other things that we don't typically consider in the same way that are interpersonal relationships, right? The way I move in front of one person may be different than the way I move in front of another person or a different context or even architectural space. Right? How I relate to the walls of a space or, or a certain terrain, right? So for me, that quality of integration really is more a quality of emergence in terms of my ability to regulate information from within and information that I'm processing from without, right? Very helpful. So, you know, it's this is kind of one of the challenges for us and is that, you know, obviously I value the scientific inquiry and anyone who knows me knows that I love that kind of uh, very precise and, and concrete type of information because it gives us a certain, um, well, a, a certain degree of certainty that is very comforting, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, Again, when we're working with a complex system, we start entering into, fortunately, an emerging area of science that is the study of complexity and emergent systems, right? And, and, and this emergent systems as, as phenomena that happens when two or more complex systems interact with each other, right? Something for which we don't really have a scientific understanding yet, but that is observable enough that people in physics, astrophysics, economics, and many other fields are starting to, uh, to study in, again, what they're calling um, the science of complexity. Yeah, so I, I'm gonna um, move forward, Juan David, if it's okay, just because yeah, thank we're about you. to run out of time. And I have two things and then I'm gonna, uh, we have Eric and David, and I wanna just sh uh, say one thing to what you were speaking about, Juan David, and a few people in the chat, which is just a personal experience that I went to the um, uh, Fascial Research Congress and I have uh, donated years ago to Eric to your project. And I really do come from the school, uh, I guess I could say the mystery school, the Guild, Peter and Emmett, and I felt like I needed more. And so I started to step into the world of science, which is not my comfort level. But what it gave to me was that there was a much bigger world and that the clients that would come in to work with me as my practice was growing had different questions. And so I really think it's important to step into areas that are not your comfort level and see what you can take home. And the story was that at the Fascial Research Congress, the most recent one in Berlin, 
Neil Thies was speaking and he said that he thought he was walking alone studying fascia and had no idea that we, the structural integrators were out there along with other people interested in fascia that were not in medicine, had a huge community and he felt all alone. So there's an example of somebody in science trying to make sense and he came to us and we now can work with within the medical world also if we have the uh, desire. So I just wanted to toss that out. We've got 10 minutes. I know Eric, your hand is up and then David, I'm gonna bring it back to you at the end. So um, Eric, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up, uh, good to meet you, Juan. I've heard about you, never met you. Uh, but three points that Juan made. Uh, yes, uh, there is now a roaring emphasis in biomedical research about complex systems. There are NIH grants, even NCCIH IH grants about myofascial pain that specify that it must be a study of a complex system. And there are now fancy statistical techniques where you can measure 10, 12 things and see how they're interacting across time. So that's a great opportunity for us because that's what, that is what we need. Uh, studying the significance of the therapist state for the, inter, the therapeutic interaction is a big deal now in placebo studies, which I just happen to have been involved in. And there's a guy at MGH named Vitaly Napadao who puts a doctor and a patient in separate MRI machines and scans their brains as, they, as the doctor treats the patient's pain. So people are really starting to look at this. And the last point about uh, the individual's ability to relate what they experience inside themselves to what they experience outside themselves. I forgot the exact day, it was 73 or something, Julian Silverman did a study. Uh, it was actually, they didn't have MRIs in those days, but it was a brain study of structural integration. And he interpreted some of the results he got in terms of this uh, dimension that was developed by these two guys, Wapner and Werner, actually in Worcester, Massachusetts, a long time ago, uh, about uh, uh, field dependence versus field independence. And they're measuring, they had clever ways of doing this as an individual property. How much was the individual's perception able to change if the environment changed or how rigid was their perception? So that's something that I've long thought we should dig up again and look at how structural integration influences that. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna read something uh, because this person has left the chat and David, maybe you could follow me uh, with some thoughts. And, and as we, um, before I read it, as we get ready to close, we have 10 more minutes. Any thoughts, comments, uh, words, anything that's coming to you, this is your opportunity just to pop it into the chat. Uh, but the question came from um, Melanie Burns, who's the, uh, CEO of Anatomy Trains, and she wrote that um, an acknowledgement of the many hours of work that's been put into the development of the SI representation at the ICMT conference by David, Eric, Bernie, Katya, Baz, I know I'm gonna pronounce your name incorrectly, Bazlav, I hope that's correct, um, and others. What specifically can we as practitioners do to engage other practitioners and professionals in our field. And I would ask you to take that home and think about who you know, uh, who you think of, if there's a name that you think about. And, and David, if you'd like to take it from here and pick up on that question also. Yeah, um, sure. And there's a, a, another question uh, that I want to address in here too. Okay. But I think the, the best way we can engage other professions is to be curious, to be open, to, you know, I, I'm fortunate. I work in a department in a hospital with three acupuncturists, um, two chiropractors, four calling birds, uh, three French hens, a couple of psychologists, EMDR, 
I was kidding about the other thing. We have a physical therapist who's also a 500 hour uh, registered yoga teacher. Uh, we have a physician who also has a degree in psychiatry. It's it's a really unique and really precious environment. I know I left a few other modalities out of there. We have a second structural integrator. She's on this call now. Hello, Deza. So nice to have you on the team. And um, it's a fantastic place to be um, because, you know, it's like, it's, um, I always thought we'd like, we'd have meetings on Fridays. We'd discuss our difficult cases because this person isn't getting the results we expect. What do you think? Um, we actually have to do that in the hallways in between because we're just not set up to have like formal meetings like that. Um, so they, we have a lot of independence. Uh, nobody's standing over us telling us this is how we're supposed to do our job or we only have so much time for X. Uh, we have a lot of autonomy in this department, and it's part of the larger field of integrative medicine. So for those of you who are mentioning specifically uh, getting poo-pooed on by the doctors, there's something close to 90, if not 100 now, integrative medicine centers that are affiliated with university hospitals or research centers in North America. And those are the places to seek out. That's where you're going to find the doctors. I have medical students who come and shadow me. And it's great. And then next year, I'll be getting a referral from somebody I don't know, because they've gone into another family medicine practice. So the referring physician is their boss, but it came from them because they sat in for three or four sessions with me. Um, the, uh, the recording just got paused. Uh, thank you. The, the better that we can clearly communicate what we do in the language that they understand or is close to what they understand. For me, it's being able to talk about anatomy and physiology. Uh, you start to build bridges with these professions. Um, and I think the other thing too, is to be curious with the other professions in a collegial way, uh, not just about what they do, but also like if, if I'm dealing with a doctor, um, I'll say, you know, who, which of your patients are you seeing that you kind of you, you kind of wish you weren't seeing anymore. And I don't mean that in a sarcastic way, but like, you don't know what to do with them. Um, send those people my way. That's a great bridge builder. You're helping them with the problem that they'd rather not admit. Um, and some actually are, are very uh, fearless about admitting it. I also want to highlight uh, our one keynote speaker, uh, Helen Langevin, who's now part of the NCCIH. She's the director of it. And their focus their strategic plan focus for the next five years is whole person health. So this is the NIH, the National Institute of Health with the NCCIH. And we could be part of that strategic plan on whole person health. Uh, and I'm thrilled to have her involved with this conference. I, I can't find the link right away, but they actually did, uh, Juan David, this goes back to what you were saying. They did a two-day seminar. It's now online available to everyone uh, on how to study complex systems. And they had, it was, it was mind-blowing. And a lot of it was over my head, but that's how you learn things. Uh, so I really recommend you seek that out. If you get me your email address, I can find a link to it and send it to you also. Um, does anybody else in the group, uh, Bernie, Eric, uh, Vatslav, Katja, have anything you want to add before we wrap this up for today? Eric. Uh, yes, uh, thank you all so much for attending. We had no idea. We thought we, we thought we might get four people. It's wonderful. <laughs> we got so many people. Uh, please, if you think that this conference process is valuable, tell other people who you know in the SI world who also might think it's valuable. Uh, and we're going to have a follow-up. We're going to have another preview uh, late, in, late in March or early in April, where we'll go over the same material again with the ideas added that we've gotten from you. Uh, so talk to people about this and get people involved. You know, there are going to be a lot of osteopaths, a lot of chiropractors, a lot of massage people, uh, even some physical therapists. If there's only a few of us at the conference, it's to our, it's to our disadvantage. This is our opportunity to be on a level playing field with all those professions. So the more people we can get interested and involved and attend the next introduction and then register for the conference, the better for the whole world of structural integration. 
So is there, Eric and, and David, um, is there a, a, an email that if anyone here has thoughts post, you know, sometimes you, you get a lot of information download after you've sat in a conference uh, of this sort that they could reach you if they have, if they have more to share, who would they contact directly? David, yeah, you're yeah, got it. Um, I'll just put my email in the chat. Um, if you send it to me, I'll be happy to send it to everyone in the group and we can add that to, to what we're doing. And that can, you know, whenever it occurs to you, um, whenever you have the time, uh, if there's something you'd like to contribute more long form that way, absolutely. And I've have noticed you? in our last minute, uh, a number of people have written to me privately just to say that this is nourishing and it's um, filling up their cup and they're so happy that they're here. So uh, let's spread that and, and uh, make this contagious so that we can get uh, more of us on here next time. But I'm really, really amazed and happy about the turnout. So I wanna thank everyone for being here and this is being recorded and uh, I can take that on my end, David, to get that posted on some of the Facebook pages, because okay. I think it's really worth other people seeing this and um, knowing that that we are here. So any last words, David, or anyone else on the team? Uh, just a huge thank you to you, Liz, for uh, moderating and uh, keeping us to time and on task and inspiring and bringing us together. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes, thank you, Liz. And please, I would go further than David went. Please would all of you give your emails to David so he can stay in touch with you. Yeah, that would yeah. be a great advantage. Yeah, and um, if you want, you can type them in the chat box too because we're gonna be saving and compiling the chat box. So you can do it either way. Do that now or just shoot me an email. I just put my email, my, my email address is my email yeah. uh, address in there. I just wanna echo what everyone else said. Uh, Liz, mwah, chef's kiss. It was so great working with you, finally collaborating with you um, after so many years of talking about things. Uh, of course, we did the other, the Aussie thing. Uh, and I just, I want to thank you for, for the wonderful presence that you brought here today. And to everybody on my working team, our working team, awesome guys, gals. Um, I, I'm just more excited after today. Uh, and I didn't think I could be more excited about this. And that's because of everybody else out there right now listening. I want to thank you, every one of you, uh, for listening, for being open to what we presented, for, for all of your good thoughts, both spoken and in the chat box. And we may be doing a follow-up to this a little bit later uh, in the year, and we'll keep you posted on part two. Uh, the email address, the email address, the conference address, if you're interested in participating, www.icmt conference.org. It, uh, it's that simple. So that's where you go to, to find out how to, how to become a part of it, how to actually engage and be at our conference in May. Thank you to everyone. Um, just uh, thank you. David, if you could put that link in the chat and then staying as close to our time boundary as everybody signs off and says goodbye, uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Would you please, if you're open to it, throw your name in with your email right before you sign off the call. And um, we will keep this call open for at least another minute or two so that as you sign off, you can uh, give us your email information so that we can keep you uh, connected to what we're And doing. hey, we just had somebody thank us for being on time. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Everybody. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. You we so really want to make that happen. Hope to see you next time. Bye for now. Goodbye. Bye, sir. Thank you, everyone. Bye, David. David Gross. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for yeah. thank you for coming. Ah. Robert, if you can sign off. And anyone else that has not signed off yet, I think there are still a few more. There's 11 people still on. And I don't know, uh, 
uh, G, if you're able to help people sign off. Yeah. If um, there's two more people that are signed in. And I think one of them might be Brian, which is fine. Nope, he left. He snuck out the back door when we weren't looking. James. James is still on, and um, that might be it. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it's just us. How are y'all doing? 